My name is Pastor Hal York. I'd like to welcome you to Hastings Park Bible Church. I'm glad you're able to join us on this special Thanksgiving weekend here in Canada. And we trust you've been able to just look around, enjoy the beauty around us, and see some of the announcements and, and that wonderful little song, He Has Made Me Glad, and we trust you are glad to join us this morning, whether it's online or here with us this morning in church. And we just are glad you're here with us. And we want to just read Psalm 100 to begin. It's a wonderful psalm of thanksgiving. Very familiar psalm. It says, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray this morning that you might bless us as we meet together, as we lift up your wonderful name, your glorious name. You are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. And we thank you for the beauty that we see around us in, the, in so many different areas. We thank you for the, the beauty of the trees in this time of year, and we thank you for the beauty of the harvest. And we just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us this year in and year out, and we thank you for your faithfulness to us this year. It's been a difficult year for many. We're thankful, Lord, that you're faithful, and we can rest in your promises. So we pray as we move through the service that you might be lifted up, that your name may be magnified and glorified, and we might truly be people who have thankful hearts. And bless us as we look into your word, and bless us as we worship together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Trust you've had an opportunity to see that some of the announcements as they were going by as we started the service. And just a couple of things that weren't on those announcements that I want to draw your attention to real quickly. Um, for all, all the parents with children, you are reminded that we have begun Sunday school. It's been going now for about three weeks. So if you're not coming out because there's nothing for your kids, we do have a program for your kids on Sunday morning. Hope they can join us. But we'll also be beginning Awana on the 21st, Lord willing. And so please, please keep that in mind in the, in the weeks ahead. We pray it will be a blessing and nothing will change those plans. 
And uh, so just be in prayer as we begin our uh, Awana program October 21st. It will be ending the last week in November before the Christmas break. We also want to remember uh, to pray for Elda Brooks. Her sister Florence Woods died this past week. We want to uphold her and the family in prayer today and uh, as they mourn the loss of her sister. And remember to pray for the others we've been praying for who were not well. Uh, there are quite a few. We think of Pat and Barb and and Loretta and uh, Clara Sargison and Bev and, and the many others who were going through some difficult times physically. We remember to pray for them and lift them up that the Lord would touch them and that they would know the, the prayers of the saints, the prayers of their church family is, are with them and we're thinking about them. I have a card here I'd like to read. It says, we, it, is, it is a great opportunity that we get to write this thank you note at this time of year, Thanksgiving. Ken and myself are truly grateful for the prayers, love, and support shown to Curtis and Nicole and our future daughter, granddaughter, on October 3rd, 2020. We all had a fantastic day with the re weather cooperating. Our family is truly blessed to belong to such a loving and caring church. Thank you so much. This time we're going to have the scripture reading and then we'll have a time of prayer and go right into the message. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festive procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, we are thankful for your word. We thank you that you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. And we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to save sinners, to come into this world to to take on himself our sin, to become our substitute, to die in our place. You laid on Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. 
that you poured out your wrath on him, that we might have life, that we might have eternal life, that we might have our sins forgiven in Jesus Christ. We were all lost and without hope, alienated from you, enemies of you, but we've been reconciled through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that and above all, above all we give thanks to you for your glorious and wonderful salvation you provided for us through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray if there's some watching this, this, this morning or today that, that you would just open their hearts and their eyes if they've never come to the place where they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and receive the only forgiveness of sins. They've become a new creation. They've been born again, made alive in Christ by the work of your spirit, by believing in Christ and Christ alone. We pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes to the beauty of Christ and what he's done for them on the cross and his great love for them. And we just pray as we move through the service that you would just exalt Jesus Christ in our hearts and remind us of who you are, remind us of how much we have to be thankful for as believers in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the home that's been prepared for us, and we have a hope that goes beyond this life, a hope that goes beyond the grave. And no matter what happens to us on this earth, we know that you care, you have your eye upon your people, and you care for us. And we're told to cast our care upon you because you care for us. We want to remember those names we mentioned this morning and lift them up before you. We think of Pat and Stan and Barb and Eric. We pray for Loretta and Clara. We pray for Bev. That you'll touch them in very special ways and that they might sense your, your presence and your healing touch. We thank you, Lord, that even though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And we pray that they might sense that and realize that in their lives. And sense your spirit strengthening them and giving them the grace that they need to go through these difficult times. And we pray for Elder Brooks. She mourns the loss of her sister. We pray for her family to bless them and encourage their hearts in Christ. And others who have lost loved ones, think of Fred and Doug and Tyre and uh, John Harney and their family and Think of Doug and Marie and, and uh, Don and Steve McLennan. We just pray for them as well, Lord, going through difficult times. And it's difficult to lose a loved one. It's difficult to see a loved one go through these difficult valleys that they're in. And we just pray, Lord, that your special grace would be upon them, your strength would st go be with them and give them the strength that they need to deal with these situations. And, and so, Father, we just pray your peace and your power and presence in their lives. They might sense you're there with them, and they might know that they're loved and being prayed for by their church family. And so, Father, we just pray for our church. We pray for that you'll watch over us. We pray for Awana as it begins in a couple of weeks. Would you bless us as we gather together, that you would just it would be a special time for the kids. Once again, we start resume learning your word and memorizing your word. And we just pray that you'll bless that program, bless our Sunday school as well, and our teachers as they're teaching our kids today. And and we just pray, thank you, Lord, for who you are, for your work in our lives. And, and Lord, we just pray for our, we know we're in a difficult period of time, and there's a lot going on around us, and there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. But we pray that we thank you that you are in control and that you're sovereign over what's going on. And we pr thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care for us and you, you're watching over us. And we pray you'll continue to build your church so that we, the church, Lord, would be forging a, a ray of light, a ray of hope that this world so desperately needs to see and hear. Father, we know the great problem in our world is not the COVID pandemic, it's, it's sin. And that we're all going to die one day and give an account to you. And we either die in our sin or we die in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize that the great need of our nation, the great need of our world is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So may we, the church, be about the business of the church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel and going into a dark world with the light of Jesus Christ, going into a confused world with the truth of the word of God, going into a world without hope and in fear of death with the answer, fear not. And so, Father, we just thank you for your message of hope that you give us in Jesus Christ, that we do not need to fear dying, but to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And so bless us this weekend as we celebrate Thanksgiving. May we truly have thankful hearts. And we give you the glory for who you are and for all you're doing in our lives and our church. And we pray your protection upon our country, upon our nation, upon our leaders. We give them wisdom, give them courage. 
We pray for a moving of your spirit in their hearts that they might come to know this gospel of Jesus Christ. But we pray that you'll just watch over them, protect them. And we pray that you'll just be bringing us as a nation back to the word of God, back to the reminder that God reigns, that God rules. God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day he's going to come back into this world and he's going to rule and reign over this whole world in person. He's going to establish his kingdom. And we thank you for that glorious promise that we have, that this world is not going to continue as it is. But Christ is coming back. We're looking for a blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may that hope buoy us up today. And may we be thankful. And so to you we give the glory. Bless us as we open your word, open our hearts and our minds to it, we pray in Jesus' name. Well, this is Thanksgiving weekend, so I'd like to just take a few moments today as we think about Thanksgiving to uh, give us some thoughts to think about. Some of it will be reminders, because I think we need to be reminded of some of these things. It's important. But when life gets hard, and it is hard, it's been hard for the last nine months, harder for some than others, mind you. But some of our, in our congregation, and many of us, have gone through some very difficult times these past few weeks past few months but when life gets hard when something bad happens when disappointment comes what's your go-to comfort food we all have our comfort food maybe it's ice cream maybe it's chocolate maybe it's cookies maybe it's pasta maybe it's fast food french fries potato chip pizza but I think you've noticed as I probably have that whatever our comfort food is we always have an ample supply of it in the house we make sure it may be hidden away somewhere in a special drawer so the kids can't find it. But it's there, and it's safe, and it's secure, and available at any time. I've also noticed that in most people's lives, comfort food is seldom healthy food. Rice cakes and carrots and broccoli and lettuce are the comfort food on very many people's menus. You don't have to hide those things from your kids. But let me ask another question, a far more important question. When life gets hard, when something bad happens, when disappointment comes, when life gets confusing, when we go through things like we've been going through in the last several months, what's your comfort attitude? Your default setting, your habitual setting that you just sort of naturally move towards. What's an 
the attitude that we naturally fall into when life gets hard or things don't go the way we wish they did. Again, comfort attitudes like comfort food are seldom if ever healthy. This comfort attitude is probably the same attitude you carry around with you all the time, festering just below the surface, unseen by others, but you know where it is. But it shows itself when things begin to go south. That's why Spurgeon said, In company, guard your tongue, but in solitude, guard your heart. Our words need watching, but so also do our thoughts and imaginations, which grow most active when we are alone. That which we meditate upon in our hearts will eventually spill out onto our lips and become evident for people to see. It may be anger, it may be resentment, it may be self-pity, it may be bitterness. But Psalm chapter 1 tells us if we listen to the counsel of the ungodly, walk with them very far, and we sit in the seat that they sit in, we will find ourselves picking up the same attitudes and habits that they use in dealing with discouraging and difficult circumstances of life. And if you've ever worked with people, you know this is true. And I think right now in our culture that we're living in, in our world that we're living in, one of the comfort attitudes that, that this epidemic that we're currently going through, the pandemic in our society right now, and that we're walking through is in the church is this. The, co the comfort attitude that many people have fallen into is murmuring. And complaining. Murmuring and complaining. And we've talked about this before, but I think it's I think a good chance this Thanksgiving weekend to be reminded of what the Bible says about murmuring. Why is it so easy to murmur and complain? The reason it's so easy is because there's so much to murmur and complain about. It's not like we have to go looking for stuff. We want to be happy, we want things to go our way, and they don't. We live in a fallen, broken world. Fallen, broken people, things don't work as they should. There's pain, there's suffering, there's death, there's disease, there's disappointments, there's heartbreak, there's heartache. And Romans 1.18 says that the more godless a culture gets, the more unthankful it will become. And we're certainly seeing that in our culture, in our world that we're living in. The people reject God, they turn away from God, they turn away from his creation and become unthankful in their hearts. It's everywhere. Listen to people. Listen to politics. Listen to your television. Tragic events everywhere. We see this attitude of discontentment. And it manifests itself sometimes by outright anger, rage and yelling and screaming. And we see that in the world. We've seen that graphically illustrated on television and on the news in the last several months. But in the church, we're more restrained. And it comes out not as anger and shaking our fists and yelling and screaming, but it comes out as murmuring and whispering. It's not new. Philippians chapter 2, a very familiar passage, says this. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 14 to 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will not have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. This is Thanksgiving weekend, and we know how to play the game of giving thanks. We know how to say the right word. We've taught our kids, remember to say thank you, and they say thank you. But saying you're thankful and being thankful are not the same thing. I'll say it now, I'm going to say it at the end of the message, nobody can make you thankful. You can read books, you can listen to sermons. We can tell you why you should be thankful, but nobody can make you a thankful person. That is a decision and a choice you have to make as you evaluate 
what Scripture says about God, your circumstances. But nobody can make you truly be thankful. To say thank you, one is just a word out of our mouth. But under the surface, there's this murmuring spirit, there's a slow boil, and it controls how we think, how we act, and how we react to life. The other attitude is that thank, true thankfulness is an attitude of the heart that bleeds into our thoughts, reasoning and being thankful. It should be saying our thoughts bleed into thanksgiving. Our reasoning is what causes us to truly give thanks because thanksgiving, as I've said other places, is the thinking man's holiday. You cannot be thankful without using your mind and your brain and your thoughts to think about who God is and all God has done for us and all the blessings he has bestowed upon us and what God says about us and himself in this world that we're living in. Murmuring and being th truly thankful are mutually exclusive attitudes. Do we want to shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, a murmuring and complaining world? And stop murmuring and stop complaining. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 5 says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. Ungrateful. That's in the list of all these other things. Arrogant, abusive, unholy, heartless, and unappeasable, slanders without self-control, brutal, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, lovers of God. In that list, is ungrateful. Being ungrateful is not a small thing in the eyes of God. Attitudes are as much a sign of Christian growth as is our behavior, and we dare not forget that. Paul says, do all things without murmuring, everything, ordinary daily chores and responsibility. But murmuring is one of those things that is very easy to get pulled into. We need to be disciplined with our tongues. Israel was famous for murmuring against Moses, but it, tragically, it was not against Moses, it was against God. We know the story in Numbers 13. You can take the time to read that yourself. In Psalm 106, verse 23, it says, then they, then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he raised his hand and swore to them that they would... Make them fall in the wilderness. It will make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Why? Because of immorality? No, because of murmuring. Murmuring. And I want to review quickly some things we've looked at before. But again, I, as I said earlier, I think it's important to remind ourselves of these things. Eight destructive results that happen when we do not control our tongues and allow it to get got, caught up in the fast-growing pastime of murmuring against God and those in authority. Because when we murmur against authority, and we have reality murmuring against the God who put them there. Number one, murmuring ignores God's potential. The report of the spies was given from a godless perspective. God was not even considered. The God who parted the sea just a few weeks before that, who brought water from a rock, demonstrate a lack of faith, a lack of contentment. They left God out of the picture altogether. Murmuring was born in a context of bad reports. Sins of the tongue that spread negative reports, gossip, slander, and false witness create an environment in which murmuring can thrive. And I think that's why there's so much of it in our culture today, because there's there's so much stuff going on, and we don't know if it's true. We have a feeling that isn't, a lot of what we're being told is not true. False news, all this other stuff. What is true, what isn't? It just causes us to murmur because we don't know. There will always be some people who wait in the wings to hear negative things so they have something to murmur and complain about. But murmuring is born in the context of bad reports. Be careful about how you talk about things to other people because you can be a, cause them to start murmuring. 
murmuring about your church, murmuring about leaders, murmuring about all kinds of things. Don't be a person who's bringing bad reports that can cause or tempt other people to fall into murmuring. A murmuring spirit, number three, is quick to jump to the wrong conclusions. Numbers 14.3 says, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? Once murmuring gets started, there's no end to where it will go. God brought them to the place where he was going, this is the land flowing with milk and honey. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for this for, since Abraham. But they get there, and all they can see is problems. All they can see is their families are going to be put at risk. We can't go in. It's too hard. And once godlessness gets grumbling and gets rolling, wrong conclusions are not hard to sell. Murmuring and becoming easy to deceive go hand in hand. Fear and murmuring go hand in hand. And consequently, bad judgments are born in the atmosphere of murmuring. They begin to plan to go back to Egypt and to stone the ones who urge them to stop grumbling and trust in the Lord. Murmuring distorts good judgment. It distorts the past as well as what is coming in the future. All of a sudden, their past in Egypt looked very, very good. They forget the bondage, they forget the slavery, the oppression that they were under. And all they see ahead of them is troubles and heartache where God promised them blessing and victory. It distorts the past and it distorts the future. Fifth, murmuring leads to self-pity. Numbers 14, 2, all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in the wilderness. I mean, what a sight. What a, what a sad, sad commentary on where these people have been. This is what murmuring looks like. And it's ugly here, but it's just as ugly in us. It's just as ugly in me as it is here. If we'd only died in Egypt. Oh, if we'd only died in the wilderness. This Christian life is getting too hard. It's going to be too hard. We can't do it. It's impossible. God calls us to live by faith, but it's too hard. And so we murmur. Murmuring thrives in an atmosphere of fear, as we said. Twice, Caleb and Joshua tell the people, don't fear, don't be afraid. They wouldn't listen. And then murmuring left unchecked leads to greed and rebellion. Joshua and Caleb urged the murmuring Israelites not to rebel against the Lord. Don't do this. And the end result of murmuring, a murmuring spirit is a general atmosphere of dissatisfaction. Discontentment is fanned by criticism and complaining. By the end of this episode, Israel was dissatisfied with their God-given lot in life. Majority reports are not always true. If a lot of people are murmuring, that doesn't mean what they are saying is accurate or from a correct perspective. We tend to wear our security and fear very close to the surface. Murmuring has no trouble attracting a crowd. So I want to close by looking at some reasons for thanksgiving. Paul says, in everything give thanks. So there must be something in everything we can give thanks for. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, because God is our Redeemer. Psalm chapter 40, he brought me up out of a horrible pit and put a new song in my mouth, even praise toward God. Thank, the God, thank God for our new spiritual creation and inheritance. That God deserves our constant praise and thanksgiving. He is our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer. Every breath that we take is a gift from God. It's reason number one. Reason number two, because it magnifies the character and the work of God. It glorifies God among men and the angels who are observers of of the behavior of the church, the body of Christ. We mentioned this last week. Thanksgiving glorifies and magnifies God because it demonstrates our recognition of who and what we are, which is inadequate, and who and what God is to us, the all-sufficient one. Because it shows our submission to and dependence upon the Lord. 
because it shows we understand that the happiness, blessing, and prosperity of any people is totally dependent on God. And we see that all through Scripture. Thirdly, because it, it's commanded by the Word of God. God commands us to give thanks, not only because it pleases and glorifies Him, but because it is of such, because it is of such great value to us in our own lives. Psalm 92.1 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give thanks. So if you're giving thanks, if you're truly thankful in your heart, that is a good thing for you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. Number four, because it is part of our service as believer priests. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him then let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of, our, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Because it enhances our worship, our adoration of God. Thanksgiving causes us to focus on the who and the what of God. It gets our eyes off ourself, people and things and conditions, and, and it gets them on the Lord where our focus needs to be. It's one of the ways we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. By how? By giving thanks to him. Because of the consequences of being unthankful, it's another reason we should give thanks. Without thankfulness, the heart grows cold and callous. We become insensitive to God and more and more self-centered and independent, going our own way and acting as practical atheists, as we see in Romans chapter 1. And I would suggest that during this time of separation from church and family that we need to guard our hearts even more so that this will not happen. And lastly, because it is a barometer of the soul, thankfulness. One of the qualities and characteristics of a godly person is that he or she is a thankful person. A thankful heart flows from an inner life that is anchored to the Lord, to his love and his grace. One writer has said that a thankful heart is one of the primary identifying characteristics of a believer. It stands in stark contrast to pride, to selfishness, and to worry. It helps fortify the believer's trust in the Lord and reliance of his provision even in the toughest times. No matter how choppy the seas become, a believer's heart is buoyed by constant praise and gratefulness to the Lord. Thanksgiving replaces and restrains these mental attitudes such as envy and jealousy and bitterness, anger and fear and anxiety and discontentment. Thankfulness replaces grumbling and complaining and criticism. But not only that, it results in positive actions for God and others. It motivates. If thankfulness does not move us to serve God, then we do not truly understand our God, who God is and what he has done on our behalf. Without gratitude or for Christ's sacrificial love, our duty will become nothing more than drudgery and our God nothing more than a dissatisfied boss. So how do we de develop and maintain a thankful heart? Well, let me give you a couple of things real quick. The first thing is to acknowledge the nature of the world that we're living in. We've been talking about this as we're going through 1 Peter. This is a fallen world. And in this world, we will have tribulation, we will have pain, and we will have heartache. This is not the Garden of Eden. This is not the millennium. This is not where we're going to have heaven on earth. Until the Lord returns, this old world is going to be filled with pain and suffering, and we're going to go, have to have our share as part of living in it, in such a world. And because God uses the various trials of life to train his people and build their faith, we can expect to have trials and struggles, as we've been talking about in Peter. As God's people who have the hope of his return and eternity, we must learn to be thankful people in the midst of pain. Accept the limitations of the things of this world. God has given us all things to enjoy, but these things were never designed to replace our relationship with him, nor our dependence upon him. They can never give peace, lasting joy, or security. Accept the limitations of this world, and I think it would be safe to accept the limitations of government. If you think the, pro the answers to our society are found in government, you're, you're going to be a very unhappy person. 
We're not waiting for the government to get it right. They're not going to get it right. The problem is not with the government. The problem is the world that we live in is a world filled with sin and sinful people. And until sin is de dealt with, until people come to know Christ, the world is going to continue to be a sinful place, a hard place. So we're called, as Peter says, to learn to live as aliens and sojourners, pilgrims. We're not home yet. And then be alert to the signs in your own life and the consequences of being unthankful. Ungrateful people are often very hard to be around. You may have a happy home, a good marriage, but if you're unthankful, it's going to have those effects on your relationship, on those that you love. You can't hide it forever because it's the way we think, and it affects our heart, and what's going on in our heart comes out. Paul lists of being ungrateful, as we read earlier, is one of the characteristics of difficult times of the last days, being ungrateful. Ungrateful people very often think somebody, God, country, family, government, owes them something, that they're entitled to certain things. But I said it earlier, and I want to say it again. No one can make you thankful. I have to think, consider, to reason. I have to make a choice. Am I going to be thankful, or am I not going to be thankful? Am I going to be thankful? Am I going to grumble and complain? I have a choice to make. I can't be talked into being thankful. I can be talked into saying why you should be thankful, but ultimately that's the work of the decision I have to make, and the Spirit of God will lead me in that decision if we're filled with the Spirit. A thankful heart is developed by staying close to the Lord, living, living in and growing by His Word through prayer, through fellowship with God's people. And so what are you thankful for? It's a good question, but it gets us going in the wrong direction. Are we thankful? This is the question the Bible asks. Because this question makes us look up. Can everything give thanks? Well, how can we do that? Well, we have to look at God. Not our circumstances, but God. Psalm 118, verse 1 says, The Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness endures forever. To all generations. Here we have a statement about the character of God. Here we have a statement about God's unchanging character. That God is good and his love endures forever and that never changes. No matter how bad things get or what we're going through in our world or in our lives, we can take confidence in the fact that God is good. Nothing's changed. Our faith will be tested at this point maybe more than any other in our life believing in the goodness of God. That God is sovereign over this world and everything in it and everyone in it. That God is in control. That God has sent his son to be the savior of the world to all those who will believe and trust in his sacrifice upon the cross for them. For he took their sin. He died for their sin. He died for all of our sins on the cross. He took our place. That God is good. He's always good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Here we have a statement about God's, our refuge in God's unchanging character. Our refuge is not found in understanding why everything happens to us in our life. Our refuge goes deeper than trying to understand his actions. Our refuge is him, his character, his unchanging character. It's a refuge. It doesn't change. It will never change. We can rest there secure in who he is. Therefore, in everything, we can give thanks, and in doing so, we will shine as lights in the midst of a dark, dark world. And in doing so, give testimony to the world that we serve a God who can be trusted. That the most important thing in this world, our lives, our family, our eternal salvation, the hope of heaven, because he is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and we can bank on that. We can trust it no matter what. May God be our refuge, our strength. May his unchanging character provide for us 
our spiritual comfort, our spiritual food that we rest in and live out every day no matter what, but we cannot trust in something that we don't know. We need to study the Word of God. We need to know and learn about God because He is our refuge. He is our refuge. William Law has said this, Would you know who was the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays the most or fasts the most. It is not he who lives the most. But it is he who was always thankful to God, who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. The great saint in the world then would be, as Paul says, the one who can in everything give thanks to him. Father, may your word touch our hearts today. May you search us, search deep down inside of us where we live, where we think, where we reason. What's going on in our hearts? Who has our hearts? Who has our attention? Who has our ear in this world right now? It will be evident in how we talk and how we speak. Are we thankful or are we murmuring and complaining? Are we fearful? Are we angry? Are we bitter? What's going on in our hearts? Lord, you know. And may your spirit do the work that only he can do through the word of God to get deep down into our hearts. And bring the word of God to soothe and to convict and to change and to challenge. That we might truly be thankful. Help us to meditate upon your word and meditate upon who you are. And give thanks for your glorious name. If there's someone watching this, I pray that you might open their hearts and their eyes to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they've never believed on him as their Lord and Savior. That they know that no matter what happens to them, whether it's we die where we live, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and we know that to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, Lord, do a work in, in each heart, in my heart, and may you remind us of who you are day in and day out, that we might truly be thankful and give thanks, that one day you're going to come back and you're going to rule in this world. You're going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and no one will argue, no, it will be in no debate Every newscaster, every person alive on this planet is going to acknowledge and bow their knee to Jesus Christ one day. And the world will know that our God reigns. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of your dear son. So, Lord, that day is coming, just as certainly as that day we're in right now. May that joy bring joy to our hearts. May we not get bogged down in the things of this world, but may we be looking up remembering the world that we're living in and the answer for this world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we not lose hope. May we not lose focus. May we not lose sight of who we are and be the church that you've called us to be and be the people you've called us to be, shining as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And to you we give the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.